A reading from Paul's second letter to Timothy, chapter 3, verse 14, through chapter 4, verse 5. Listen for a good word from the Lord. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it, and how from childhood you have known the sacred writings that are able to instruct you for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is inspired by God and is useful for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, so that everyone who belongs to God may be proficient, equipped for every good work. In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing and his kingdom, I solemnly urge you, proclaim the message. Be persistent, whether the time is favorable or unfavorable. Convince, rebuke, and encourage with the utmost patience in teaching, for the time is coming when people will not put up with sound doctrine, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own desires and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander away to myths. As for you, always be sober, enduring suffering, do the work of an evangelist, carry out your ministry fully. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I think it was last Sunday night, I was saying goodnight to our daughter, after the normal nightly routine, she will usually cuddle with her mother for a little while, but after she's finished snuggling with her, she will ask for daddy, and I'll come back in to say a final good night. Most nights I will lie down next to her for just a moment and say, I'm only staying for two minutes. Then she'll grab my arm and hold on tight so I'll stay longer. She'll usually roll over and close her eyes and start to fall asleep. The other night, however, she was in a more excited mood than usual at that time. I'm not entirely sure what was going on. It might have been the fact that she had just had worship that day. I think it might also have had something to do with the fact that it was a full moon that weekend. I'm not certain if there have been studies done about the impact of a full moon on the moods of children, but I'm pretty convinced that something happens with the change in the gravitational pull of the full moon that gives my children at least more energy than they normally have. And I'm pretty sure that other parents and anyone who works with children will say, something similar. On that night, when I started to climb back into her bed for those two minutes, her daughter rolled over and looked at me with this excited expression and said, Daddy, can I sing something for you? Well, of course you can, I said. I wasn't going to miss out on that. And she started to sing in a sweet but confident voice those familiar words, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so, little ones to him belong, they are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me, for the Bible tells me so. Daddy, did I get that right? You sure did. There's a story about the great 20th century theologian Karl Barth. It may be somewhat apocryphal and not 100% true, but the story says that Barth was once giving a lecture at the University of Chicago and during the question and answer time after his lecture, a student was said to have asked him, asked this great neo-Orthodox theologian, if he could find a way to sum up all of his theology, everything he had ever written or thought or believed about God in just a few words. As the story goes, Bart thought for a moment and then confirmed that he could, in fact, sum up all of his theology. He said, I can sum it up with the words of a song that I learned at my mother's knee. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Did I get that right, Daddy? You sure did. Our daughter heard that first from her mother and I as we sang her to sleep when she was a baby. It's been reinforced by Sunday school teachers and preschool workers, other ministers, and others that have been part of her growing as of late, she has learned those words and the words of other songs that she and other children of our church are being taught during their music and children's choir time on Sunday mornings each week. And these songs are already sinking in for her and for others. She can't stop singing them. The other day she told my wife that she only has worship songs in her head right now, she said, to which my wife added when she was talking to me about it, I suppose there are far worse things you could have swimming around up there. At least they will be there to depend upon when you need them most. I'm not sure I could have said it better myself. 
And I think that is one of the points that Paul is trying to make when he writes to his friend Timothy. When life and ministry are difficult, and we have said over the last few weeks that things got very difficult at different times for both Paul and Timothy in their ministry. In those times of difficulty, remember what you were taught from an early age. Paul wanted Timothy to think back to the times when he learned about God and Jesus from his grandmother and mother in particular. Think back to the things that he learned from all of those who told him the stories about Jesus. Think back to every scripture he had ever read or had been read to him. Remember those things, Paul urged to Timothy, and lean upon them when you don't know where else to turn. Those things, they are swirling around up there somewhere in your mind. They are in your heart and in your spirit, and they will carry you far if you lean upon them. Now, I don't know what you do at 9 o'clock on Thursday mornings, but whatever it is, I can almost guarantee you that I am having more fun than you are. At 9 o'clock on Thursday mornings, I get to gather right here in our sanctuary with our oldest two preschool classes for our weekday preschool for their weekly chapel time. I get to tell them the stories of the Bible. I hadn't led chapel in a few years when our former minister to students took it on, but now I have the chance to lead chapel again. I had no idea how much I missed it. Just getting to share the stories of faith with the children. I get to talk about Adam and Eve, Abraham and Sarah, Jacob and Esau, Noah and Moses, Joseph and Jonah, Ruth and Esther. Most importantly, I get to talk about Jesus. Those are the stories I love the most. I get to tell them about Jesus healing the sick, the blind, those who couldn't walk, and those who had leprosy. I get to tell them about times when Jesus fed 5,000 people, or when he walked on the water, or when he rebuked and basically spanked the water to calm the storm. I get to tell them about his disciples and his transfiguration. I get to tell them about his crucifixion and his resurrection. I get to be one of the first ones to tell them about how much Jesus loves them and how we know that in so many ways, but especially because we read about those stories in the Bible. We don't want them to just hear it from me or from their preschool teachers or from any other single source. We want them to learn the stories and to read them for themselves. So when they graduate from the preschool, we give them a Bible. When our congregational children move from kindergarten to elementary school, we give them a Bible. When they move to middle school, we give them a Bible. When they graduate from high school, we give them a Bible. A new age-appropriate version of the Word of God is the most common gift by churches at milestones like these. For good reason. We know how important it is to read the Bible and learn the stories of the faith so that they will stick with you. You know, when we dedicate children, when we ask God's blessings upon them at the beginning of their lives, along with the parents and the rest of the family, one of the things that we always say in that beautiful ritual is that we promise to be the church that they need, specifically by teaching them the stories of God and Jesus found in the Bible. It's at the heart of who we are called to be as a church. Collectively, we teach the stories of the Bible. We study them together. We learn them together. We shape our individual lives around them. We learn to appreciate and love them. We teach them to others by the way we act like Jesus in welcoming people and helping people through mission work. We teach them in worship by preaching them, even singing them when they are put to song. The most important thing we can do as a church is teach the stories of the Bible as they teach us about Jesus. Paul says that these stories are inspired by God. The word he uses here is theonustos. We translate it as inspired, but it literally means God breathed. It draws us back to Genesis 2 when God forms the human and breathes the breath of life into its nostrils. And in this context, to say that Scripture is inspired by God isn't to say that it's inerrant or infallible like people like to argue over the Scriptures and the issues of the day, the way that they throw out the old, well, the Bible says it, and I believe it, and that settles it. Now, in this context, it means that the stories of the Bible, especially when read through the lens of Jesus Christ, have creative potential. They are life-giving. As we read them, hear them, learn about them, 
they have the potential to breathe life into us and shape us and to shape our understanding of the world. Have you ever tried to read the Bible all the way through? Maybe you took one of those challenges to read every word of the Bible from Genesis 1-1 to Revelation 22-21. Maybe you started with the Gospels and jumped around. Maybe you followed a daily lectionary pattern or devotional that focused on passages from multiple different genres of Scripture each day until you finally came to the end. If you ever tried anything like that, I can guarantee you that there were parts of the Bible you loved. You were drawn to them, inspired by them, and they revealed Christ to you. There were other parts, however, that made you cringe. There were strange passages. Some are classified as texts of terror. If you only read certain portions, they could shape your perspective in negative ways. Just enough scripture to be dangerous without getting the full perspective and spirit behind the entire thing. Keep reading. It sometimes feels to me that encountering the scriptures is like encountering pieces of art. Sometimes you like them, sometimes you don't. Sometimes you are moved, sometimes you aren't. But liking the art may not be the point of it at all. The purpose of art is to allow the artist to say something, express something, capture something about being part of this world. The artist uses it to hold your attention and get a reaction. Sometimes it may be awe and the feeling of being overwhelmed by great beauty, and that's okay. Sometimes it may make you sad, angry, uncomfortable, or whatever, and that's okay too. Sometimes the point may not be to make you feel good. Sometimes the point is to confront something that is broken in you and in the world. The experience itself is the point. Being moved to feel and experience something is the point. When it comes to reading the Bible, transformation, God-breathed, life-giving transformation is the point. You'll come across passages that will make you feel warm and fuzzy as if the Holy Comforter was wrapping you in a warm blanket. You will come across other passages that will challenge you and make you question everything you thought you knew. You will come across other passages that will make you grieve the brokenness of our world and will hopefully inspire you to do something about it. But the point is to keep reading. When you come to a passage that you love, keep reading because the next one will rock your world. When you come to a passage that you cannot stand, keep reading because good news and grace may be found on the next page. But keep reading, and let the words keep reading you. Let God keep breathing life into you through those words. Let God reveal Jesus to you through those words. Let God transform you through those words. You know, the Bible itself gives us one of the greatest possible image of what it looks like to read the scriptures and to be in relationship with God in general, to allow God to speak to you and breathe through them to transform you. It actually comes in the Old Testament lesson that was assigned for the lectionary readings for today. We didn't read it today, but it's one of my favorite Old Testament stories. It's found in Genesis 32. It's the story of Jacob, the younger son of Isaac, who stole his brother Esau's birthright and blessing, and he's been on the run of his life for a long time. That is until he can't run any longer. He is in a tough spot. He knows that his brother Esau and his family and friends and basically Esau's posse is on the other side of the Jabbok River and that the next day Jacob is going to be confronted by his past mistakes. So Jacob sends his wives and his servants and his children and his livestock and everything else to the other side of the Jabbok. But he stays behind for the night alone with his thoughts and with his prayers. During the night, he is confronted by someone who takes hold of him and wrestles with him all night long. And they struggle until the stranger can't do anything else but put Jacob's hip socket out. And at last, Jacob puts the stranger in a chokehold and pins him into place. He would not let him go until the stranger has blessed him. The stranger just doesn't leave Jacob with a limp, but he blesses him with a new identity. No longer will you be called Jacob, the stranger tells him. You will be called Israel because you have striven with God and humans and prevailed or lived. This is what we do in our life of faith. This is what we do in our relationship with God. This is what we do when we study the scriptures and allow God to breathe life into us through them. We have a God 
who comes to us where we are, but refuses to leave us where we are. So we wrestle. We agonize over those stories. The wrestling changes us, leaving its mark on our life. It shapes our identity until it becomes the most important thing, sometimes the only thing, swimming around in our heart and mind and soul. It's the only thing that helps get us through the difficulties of life. And like anything else, the more we wrestle, the stronger we become the more equipped we become to persist among the other voices that would draw us in a different direction. And as followers of Jesus, like Paul and Timothy, it is crucial that we keep the wrestling match going and that we continue to grow in our faith because it feels like today we actually live in the very world that Paul envisioned. For the time is coming, Paul said, when people will not put up with sound doctrine, but having itching ears They will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own desires and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander away to myths. I can't think of a better description of some of the greatest challenges facing us today. We live in a world where people's viewpoints and perspectives are shaped only by their favorite news channels or social media outlets. We live in a world of tribalism and siloed lives and echo chambers. We live in a world where everyone has itching ears, it seems, and everyone wants to follow the next new philosophy that just makes them feel good. We live in a world where people will believe the wildest conspiracy theories possible that have no basis whatsoever in fact if it simply reinforces their prejudices. People will believe anything these days, it seems. We live in a world where people have itching ears. Now, I'll admit that I can be pretty cynical about this sometimes, When I think about much of the world today, it breaks my heart as a result. But if I wanted to find a positive spin on the challenging of itching ears, then perhaps I might lean into the idea put forth in one of the commentaries that I read as I was preparing for this week's sermon, where it basically said that perhaps the fact that people will latch on to what seem like the wildest theories and philosophies today is actually revealing a cry for help of sorts. Perhaps it is revealing the fact that the world is desperately hungry for a different story, a better story than whatever it is feeling that has been taught to this point. So perhaps we have what Paul wanted to remind Timothy of. Perhaps what we have is a new opportunity to tell the story in a new way, a deeper way than it has been told in the past. A story that is bigger than our concerns about decline in the church attendance or changes in culture. A story that is deeper than claiming your blessing and living your happiest life. A story that is bigger than who wins the next election. Paul said it earlier in the letter, in the passage that we considered last week in our sermon time, where he said, Jesus Christ raised from the dead a descendant of David. It is his story that we tell. It is his story that we wrestle with and struggle to live out each day. It is his story that shapes our lives. It is bigger and better than any story the world knows. It is more hopeful and more joy-filled. It is about grace and love that is better than any other story ever told. And that's the story we hold on to when the other stories fail us. Because we know it will never fail us. It will give us strength to persist through life's challenges. It ties us back to the author of life and faith. It transforms us and sums up all that we know to be true. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Did I get it right? Amen.